a terrified wife with nowhere to hide. Right now we're not safe with Daddy. Michelle Lee and James Parentino, when no one would listen. 8.30 Monday. This program proudly brought to you by Citibank, bringing the spirit of competition to personal banking and Ansett Australia, one of the world's great airlines. Good evening, I'm Juanita Phillips. This is the Late Night News. Heading the Late Night News, Indonesians retaliate setting alight Australian flags as the row over burning national symbols intensifies. Terrorists strike at the heart of Paris, a nail bomb explodes, injuring 16. And a long-awaited tribute to our greatest living artists. Most people uh, that excel deserve to be noted. We begin tonight with hot debate over whether Australia should ban the burning of flags. It follows demonstrations yesterday and today where foreign flags were set alight. The issue is dividing senior ministers and angering foreign governments. In Indonesia today, about 60 protesters from a government-sanctioned youth organisation ripped, kicked and burnt two Australian flags at our embassy in Jakarta. Despite a police presence, the demonstrators entered the diplomatic grounds and attacked the flagpole. There's no formal protest from the Australian government, but an official reminder to the Indonesians that we expect our embassy to be protected. It was retaliation in kind for this incident in Melbourne on Wednesday, which offended the Indonesian government. The Australian embassy in Jakarta apologised, but noted that protests, including flag burning, were an integral part of Australia's democracy. But it's a democratic right Defence Minister Robert Ray wants to ban. I think the government long term will have to look at uh, outlawing this and making it illegal to burn another country's flag. It's not clear whether burning the Australian, as well as a foreign flag, could also end in a prison term, because the proposed law has not yet been drafted. Well, I know the def Defence Minister has said that that's worth a matter, that's, that ought to be a matter for consideration. Uh, whether or not we ought to outlaw it, and I'd agree with him. Protesters say they're not trying to offend the people represented by the flags. We're on the side of the Indonesian people, but we're against their military government that's killing people. The opposition is critical, saying this comes on top of government threats to jail journalists who reveal embarrassing spy secrets. This is an authoritarian government, and this is just another example of the authoritarian nature of this government. It's a tired, arrogant government that believes if people disagree with it, they should just be, they should be fined or thrown in jail. The government is now indicating that any ban is merely a suggestion, but it could be hard to back down. Having admitted it could stop flag burning if it wanted to, it would be a double diplomatic embarrassment for the government if it allowed it to continue. Paul Smith, 10 News. There will be no Australian protest ship at the Muroroa test site because a seaworthy vessel couldn't be found. The journey was abandoned today, but the politicians involved say they will still demonstrate against the French nuclear testing from Tahiti. The French have been enemy number one for weeks, but with yesterday's secretive bomb blast by the Chinese, anti-nuclear sentiment is again at the forefront. This demonstration outside the Chinese embassy in Sydney with environmental groups showing their disgust with nuclear testing. A smaller protest in Canberra, but with industrial action still in place at the French embassy, the unions are now targeting the Chinese. I'd be hopeful that uh, the union movement will be able to impose similar kinds of uh, bans and limitations upon this embassy as we currently have on the French embassy. Meanwhile, the politicians might be having trouble finding a boat to take them to Muraroa, but three lucky Aussie school kids have gathered in Sydney before leaving tomorrow for Paris. I don't believe that we're either of us or any of us are going to France as their enemy. We're not anti-French, we're just anti-nuclear testing. The trip's being funded by the union movement and ACTU President Martin Ferguson used the occasion to condemn the Chinese test. And I would have thought, for example, that Japan, which is a fairly significant economic power, ought to send a message to China that will enough is enough. The 16 and 17 year olds will lay the flags of the Pacific nations under the Eiffel Tower and present protest letters to the French. 
Mark Gibson, 10 News. In Paris, a bomb packed with nails has exploded near the Arc de Triomphe, injuring 16. It's the second terrorist attack on the French capital in less than two months. So far, no one has claimed responsibility. In the heart of tourist Paris, at the peak of the evening rush hour, the attack was designed to cause the maximum panic and the maximum casualties. The bomb exploded in a rubbish bin on one of the city's busiest streets. Within minutes, ambulances were carrying the injured to hospital. Among them, a British woman of 60, said by the French authorities to be among those more seriously hurt. There were children, too, among the victims. There are many children involved. I personally have seen four, although there could be more. One in particular was badly injured. No one has yet admitted carrying out last month's bombing on the Paris underground, which killed seven people. But the French authorities make no secret of their belief that terrorist groups linked to Islamic fundamentalists fighting the French-backed government in Algeria are responsible. Prime Minister Alain Juppé ordered security to be stepped up in the wake of that bombing, but it seems the investigation is making little real progress. Within hours this evening, all trace of this latest explosion has been removed. But the French government fears the danger of further attacks remains as long as the Algerian civil war itself is unresolved. This is the second no-warning bomb attack in Paris within a month, and it will further raise fears that the violence spilling over from the Algerian civil war onto the streets of France may now be turning into a terrorist campaign. Australian tourist Belinda Curry, who was badly burned in a car accident in Greece, has lost her battle to live. The young mother's plight made national headlines with an appeal raising $40,000 to bring her home for urgent surgery. Belinda died last night from a blood clot. Just a very happy, fun-loving person. Lived for today and you know, whatever happens tomorrow happens. And just full of life. Horribly injured in a car accident in Athens last month, Belinda Curry suffered burns to 80% of her body. Doctors warned she had only a slim chance of survival, but Belinda fought on despite the odds. Four weeks after the accident, and even her family thought she'd pull through. Yeah, she was making progress off the critical list. Um, we were anticipating when she was going to be home and uh, trying to find out from the doctor's exact dates, making the plans to be obviously the welcome at the airport, etc. But so yeah, the overnight news is shocking, isn't it? Doctors say Belinda had been undergoing minor surgery in an Athens hospital when she died of a blood clot in her lung at one o'clock this morning, Australian time. She made an enormous attempt. Um, mentally a great fight but a medical problem happened that she was out of control after recently celebrating her seventh birthday cassandra was told of the death this morning obviously very very distressed but at the same time being a brave little girl and trying to sort of carry on and uh, children i don't know the words to describe how they deal with these things tim mitchell 10 news Tributes flowed today for the man affectionately known in Victoria as Mr. Football. Player, coach and commentator Ted Whitten last night lost his long battle with cancer. He was 62. Today, a planned dedication of a bridge, which was to be postponed, went ahead at his family's request. Fans and mourners of all ages gathered at Ted's home ground, laying floral tributes. And there will be more on the life and achievements of Ted Whitten coming up in Sports Tonight, right after the news. A day of memories and emotions across Australia today as Vietnam veterans remembered the Battle of Long Tan. Old mates gathered around the country at ceremonies marking the battle victory. It was an occasion charged with emotion, with each year meaning so many different things to the hundreds of Vietnam vets who attend. Perhaps love, perhaps a bit more understanding. It's a day to remember your mates, think of your mates, think of your friends, and help your, your loved ones. Today marks the anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan, where 108 Australian soldiers fought more than 2,500 Viet Cong. They eventually won the battle, but not before losing 18 young soldiers. Today we remember, we reflect, but most of all, in our separate ways, we will never forget. 
nor should any other Australian forget, and nor will history allow the Vietnam War to be forgotten by this country. This day each year is the equivalent of Anzac Day for Vietnam veterans who fought for more than 20 years to be acknowledged after being shunned when returning from their tour of duty. Today, several thousand people attended the service where wreaths were laid in remembrance of those whose lives were lost in the battlefields of the Vietnam War. I come here to remember, to pay homage and to try to never ever forget what happened and hope that it never happens again. Peter Morris, 10 News. Still to come, tragedy on one of the world's toughest mountain climbs. And a minky whale given a helping hand back to sea. The search goes on tonight for seven elite climbers missing in an avalanche on the world's second highest mountain, K2 in Pakistan. British solo climber Alison Hargraves is believed to be among the victims, but one of the survivors is Peter Hillary, the son of Sir Edmund. Britain's Alison Hargraves was literally on top of the world last March when she became the first woman to climb Mount Everest solo and without the help of oxygen. When we go climbing, we obviously minimise the risks, and if we thought it was that risky, we wouldn't go climbing. A month later, having said goodbye to her two young children, she set out to climb treacherous K2 in Pakistan, the world's second highest peak. She had just left the summit with an American climber when they were engulfed by the avalanche. Allison and Rod Slater together reached the summit of K2 at about 6 p.m. on the 13th and made a radio call, and then that's the last anyone has heard from them. Five days later, her husband hasn't given up hope but fears the worst. I've been rehearsing this dreadful day for, for nearly 10 years. Four New Zealanders, a Canadian and a Swede, were also caught in the explosion of snow and ice, taking K2's overall toll to more than 40 deaths. Sir Edmund Hillary's 39-year-old son, Peter, who now lives in Melbourne, was lucky to survive. He's a close friend of Sydney's Greg Mortimer, the first Australian to conquer K2 five years ago. Once you go above 8,000 metres, it's, it's like being on another planet and it can be very, very difficult to get down. Rescue teams will try to recover the lost climbers when the weather at the summit of K2 clears. Harry Potter, 10 News. On the same day as the Paris bombing, another terrorist attack in Spain. A huge car bomb ripped through a police barracks, injuring 40 and destroying dozens of cars. The bomb was estimated to contain 45 kilograms of explosive. Police said the building's thick walls prevented any fatalities. No one has claimed responsibility, but it's believed to have been planted by Basque separatists who are fighting for independence. South African President Nelson Mandela and his wife Winnie are getting divorced. They've been separated for more than three years. The separation followed a series of scandals involving Winnie, including her conviction on charges of kidnapping four black youths, one of whom was murdered by her bodyguard. Legal experts say it's unlikely the couple will appear in court because a lengthy separation indicates there's no chance of reconciliation. Amidst the carnage and the chaos of the Balkans war, a story of remarkable courage involving a 10-year-old boy. Dejan Popovic, seen driving this car, has single-handedly saved his entire family. He's a Serb from the Kraina region. Like many thousands of others, he's fleeing to Serbia. What makes him stand out, though, is that he drove his father's car for a whole week, all the way to safety in Belgrade, rescuing his mother, sister, grandmother, cousin and a 14-month-old baby. Well, cutting down on calories may be the wrong way to lose weight after all. British researchers now say the key to dropping those kilos is all in the mind. It always puzzles people who are determined to lose weight why so often they fail. The answer, according to scientists, is that your own body works against you. But dieting can lead to a lowering of a chemical which helps to regulate appetite. This, in turn, triggers a loss of control over eating behaviour. And that's why some people who at first lose weight find it impossible to resist going on a binge later. A team at Oxford who've been researching this say that people who fail in their diet shouldn't feel guilty. What's happening as a result of dieting is that brain chemicals are being altered and it's the changes that occur in the brain as a result of the brain chemicals being altered that lead to people's attempts to diet being frustrated. While dietary experts examine this report, the latest in a long line, people are increasingly turning to health clubs in their efforts to lose weight. They may not have heard about this all-important chemical 5-HT, which is lowered in the body during a diet, but they're well aware of the physical consequence. 
usually you get very hungry while you're dieting. I mean, you want to eat the whole time, and it's, it's a pain because you, you keep telling yourself that you can't have that, and you get really hungry, and then you eat, and then you feel bad about it. Doctors still say the best advice for losing weight is sensible eating and regular exercise. But scientists may yet play a part too. They're trying to develop a drug which will replace the missing chemical in the body and so reduce hunger pangs. Could it be the missing link? Scientists in Kenya have found remains which they think might be man's nearest relative. They claim to have found fossil evidence of a human-like creature which walked upright on the plains of Africa some four million years ago. Last year, the oldest human-like fossil, nicknamed Lucy, was discovered. Today's find is younger than Lucy, give or take a million years, but it looks a lot more like the people of today. A young minke whale is back exploring the Pacific tonight after being rescued by locals on Fraser Island. The four and a half metre minke was found high and dry yesterday afternoon. No one knows why it beached, but environment department staff and water police were determined to rescue it. But nothing could be done until the tide came back in. Apart from some bite wounds inflicted by sharks, the whale seemed to be in good health. Rescuers manoeuvred a trampoline mat underneath the whale and dragged it out to deeper water. Then it did what whales do best and headed out into the blue beyond. Ahead in the late night news, a drug dealer's jailed for Australia's largest ever heroin haul. And what's all the fuss about this house? It doesn't fit in. It uh, stands out like a sore thumb. A Darwin court has sentenced three Thai nationals to life in jail over the largest ever heroin shipment into Australia. The three men were crew on this ship, which entered Darwin Harbour in July last year. On board, 120 kilograms of high-grade heroin, with an estimated street value of up to $300 million. Five other men on the boat have pleaded not guilty to charges of importing the drug. A 26-year-old martial arts enthusiast will stand trial for the murder of an amateur fisherman and the attempted murder of two other men at a Sydney beach earlier this year. Graham Castle is accused of a random attack on the three men after they stopped their boat at a beach in April. And a man accused of offering to sell prosecution documents to Alan Bond's son will be extradited from New Zealand to Perth in just a few hours. Solicitor Michael Crowley, who worked for the Director of Public Prosecutions, is charged with official corruption and disclosure of information in the Bell Resources case. It's alleged he tried to sell information to John Bond, who refused the advances and went to police. An effort to brighten up a Gold Coast home has led to a council direction to tone it down. The owner says she likes the blue hue. Local regulations say only green or brown are allowed. Love it or hate it, this is the house in Corumban causing all the fuss. It doesn't fit in. It uh, stands out like a sore thumb. It's a shade called slate blue, a bit purple to the eye, but nevertheless a lovely, colourful home according to its owner. Wendy Plummer believes a home should brighten someone's day, but the local council disagrees. Well, the purple house uh, is a little bit of an unfortunate uh, occurrence. Under the Crumban Hill Development Control Plan, houses must be either green or brown to blend with the environment. I don't think purple is uh, any, uh, anywhere near close to a green and a brown. There are two other homes in the same street that don't comply either, but they were built before the rule came in four years ago. We're not trying to say to people that they can't have some individuality in their, in their uh, choice of colours for their home, but we are saying that they should try and blend in as much as possible. Councillor Turner says court action will be a last resort. He'll try and negotiate first. But as for Mrs Plummer, well, she says she'd rather languish behind the grey walls of jail than repaint her house a boring colour. Lisa Backhouse, 10 News. In finance news, our share market weakened throughout the day to close near its lows. The All Ordinaries lost nine and a half points. BHP slid 28 cents. No international buyers came to its rescue, but some stocks felt the effect of better commodity prices. Camalco up 10. The banking sector was pulled down by the National, which eased 10, and Westpac down 7. Qantas improved 2 cents, allowed to boost its capacity to Canada, and a similar proposal on the way for Indonesia. The dollar is trading in London at 73.65 US cents, 47.69 pence and 71.69 yen. Gold is strong at $385.50 an ounce. The FTSE is up 36 points in morning trade. The Hang Seng down just one. The Nikkei eased 17.
coming home today, one of Australia's best known and most loved artists. Arthur Boyd returned from overseas to officially accept the honour of being named Australian of the Year. Arthur Boyd has been drawing inspiration from the Australian landscape for more than half a century. To show their appreciation, his countrymen voted the 83-year-old Australian of the Year for 1995. But the often reclusive artist didn't personally receive his award until today. That's the value of the award, I think, to acknowledge again the presence, uh, the contribution of our greatest artist. Most people uh, that excel in their, in their work deserve some kind of, uh, not an accolade, but they deserve to be noted. About 100 prominent members of the Australian art world gathered at the Arthur Boyd Bundanon Properties near Nowra. Several years ago, Mr Boyd gave the $8.5 million South Coast property to Australian artists. It was at this quiet country refuge that Mr Boyd received his award, with Prime Minister Paul Keating using the occasion to launch next year's search for Australian of the Year. A new program for young Australian artists has also been announced today. Two artists from each state and territory will come to study here for one week with Arthur Boyd. Mr Boyd plans to stay at Bundanon House until his family joins him for Christmas. Lisa Clifford, 10 News. Stay with us after the break for a most unusual race. Also, the all-important weather, weekend weather forecast and sports tonight with Tim Webster. Juanita well, ahead in the big one-hour edition, just how well-liked is Mike Tyson by the American public. There's a chance to be a part of a new extreme sport, plus NBL basketball, of course, all tonight's rugby league and AFL action, including the tributes to the late Ted Whitman. I'm sure the people of the suburbs will be feeling the same way I am at the moment, so... Yeah, it's pretty hard. We'll take a look at the national weather now, and it was unbelievably warm along the east coast today. Sydney, a summery 25 degrees. Brisbane, 23. Melbourne, fine and 21 for maximum. 28 in the centre, 31 and fine in Darwin. On the satellite, nothing much to report, no cloud of note. That's why the fine, warm conditions dominate. On tomorrow's chart, the strong high is bringing the abnormally warm weather to the east. A cold front will be in the bite by Sunday night, possibly cooling down those temperatures. Saturday's forecast, 23 degrees for Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, and Canberra not far behind with 21. 30 for Darwin and Alice Springs, but some showers in Perth. And finally tonight, just how fast can a cockroach go? Well, that's the question American pest controllers were asking at the 7th annual roach race. The entrants were some of the fattest cockies you're ever likely to see, and instead of zapping them, the experts were racing them. Ladies and gentlemen, the roach races are about to begin at the far end of the tent. <laughs> These cockroaches flew all the way in from Madagascar, the home of the world's biggest and most revolting cockroaches. And you thought they lived in your kitchen. You were wrong. That's the late night news for this Friday. Stay on 10 now for the hour-long edition of Sports Tonight with Tim Webster. I'm Juanita Phillips. Thanks for your company and have a great weekend. Good night. This program proudly brought to you by Citibank, bringing the spirit of competition to personal banking and Ansett Australia, one of the world's great airlines. Sport in crisis. Player strikes, I think, will be an issue in the future. More codes are under threat. Well, the league lost all support. Can other sports keep up with pay television? Unless you've got sport on it, no one's going to buy it. The changing face of Australian sport, Monday in 10 News at 5 o'clock.